from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to take my text from my new book. It's found Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He made a choice. Joshua voted. Now, Joshua had led the people of Israel after the death of Moses. He was a great general. And now, at the end of his life, he's called all the people together at Shechem. Now, Shechem was between two mountains. One was the mountain of law, and the other one was another mountain. And between those two mountains, they gathered. Now, the history of Israel was always up and down. For a little while, they'd serve the Lord, and then they would fall back in their old ways and go to their old idols. And in this case, it was Baal. And he was telling them, you've got to make a choice. It's between Baal and God. Which is it going to be? Who do you vote for? You know, we have old proverbs. I suppose you have them here in North Florida. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now, they made decisions, and they cast their votes, no matter what the cost was, because of what they believed. And Joshua said, I'm calling my family together, and we're voting for God. We're going to serve the true and the living God. Now, outwardly, the followers of God but deep in their hearts, they were idolatrous. And Joshua says that such a condition cannot continue. You must decide whether you're going to worship those idols or worship the living God. And they must decide immediately. That was Israel's day of election, Israel's day of decision. They must go on record for God or against him. And you must decide tonight. There are hundreds of people here tonight that have to decide tonight, and your decision tonight, yes or no, will decide where you'll be a hundred years from now. Because you see, only one God can occupy the throne of your heart. The Scripture says, The first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, we have idolatry today in subtle ways. Our actors and actresses and Academics many times, and even athletes, can very easily, subtly become our gods. Richard Phelps wrote in Time magazine in September with regard to the cocaine deaths of sports superstars. He said, the trouble is that Americans tend to think of athletes as godlike beings. And sometimes that is true. We make too much of some of the young players, and these young players sometimes just cannot take it, and they crack up because it takes experience and maturity to take all the money and all the fame so suddenly at such a young age. And Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. But regardless of what the people did, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't care if the whole outfit turns against God. I don't care if all of you turn to idolatry. My house and me, we're going to serve the true and the living God. Have you ever said that? Have you ever said, I'm going to serve Christ no matter what my peers think or what my classmates think or what the people that I work with think or my neighbors Robert Browning exclaimed a hundred years ago, this business of life is made up of terrible choices. And it is. We have to make some of these choices in our lives. Adam had to make that choice. Was he going to build his world with God and have peace in the world and justice in the world? Or was he going to go his own way? He decided to go his own way and to listen to the devil. And he led the whole world astray. The rich young ruler came to Jesus wanting to find some spiritual help. And Jesus said, all right, would you like to have eternal life? 
Well, the rich young ruler said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, if you want eternal life, you do this and this and this and this. The rich young ruler left sadly because he couldn't pay the price, and Jesus would not bargain with him. Every person that ever lived has to make the same choice. It's either the world and its pleasures and its gods or it's Christ. Which is it for you? Now, first, we must choose two ways of life, between two ways. The prophet I, Jeremiah wrote, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Which road are you on? Jesus Christ said, I am the way. I am the way. Come to Christ. He will give you a new strength and a new power and a new joy and a new peace and a purpose for living. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, the Bible says, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It looks right, that road you're on. The path you've chosen looks right. It looks so good. That business you're in, that school you're in looks so good. But one of these days, unless you're committed to Christ and in the will of God, you'll soon find out that you're on the wrong road. Some people say, well, if I follow my conscience, isn't that enough? No, because your conscience can be dead. Many people have a dead conscience. But when you come to Jesus Christ, he resensitizes the conscience. You see, you, you, you tell a lie when you're a child and your conscience bothers you. Now you can look a person straight in the face and tell a lie and it doesn't bother you at all. There was a time when you do some other things that bother you, now you can do it and it doesn't bother you. You say, well, that's not so bad then. Your conscience doesn't bother you. Why? Because your conscience has been seared or it's dead. But when you come to Christ, he gives you a new conscience so that you can be sensitive to those things that are wrong. People say, well, being sincere, if I'm sincere in life, isn't that enough? No, it's not enough. You can be sincere. My mother was very sincere one time when I was sick and she gave me some iodine by mistake. She thought she was giving me cough medicine but it was wrong, sincerely wrong. Or they say, well, if I, I, I do so, so many good things for people and I smile at people and I'm friendly with people, don't you think God understands if I commit a little sin now and again? And he, he'll understand. He's a good God. He's a loving God and all that. No, God doesn't understand. If you know Christ, then those sins are forgiven. But you see, we are not saved by our goodness and our own works. I've come from a country, France, where many people think that they're saved by, being, by their good works. They've been taught that since childhood as a part of religion. But you're not saved by good works. You're saved by the grace of God, for by grace are we saved through faith in that, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I was saved by my own goodness, I'd get up to heaven and walk around and brag and say, look what I did to get here. I was a good boy. But we're all sinners. None of us deserve to be in heaven. God says that we're to be as holy as he is. I can't be as holy as God. So what happens? Christ came and died on the cross and shed his blood to provide for me a holiness that I do not naturally have and he provides a cloth, a cloth of holiness for me and righteousness that I don't deserve. Then there are people who say, well, I reformed. Yes, you can reform the rest of your life, but that's not it. You must come to Christ and you must enter the narrow gate and walk the narrow road. So there's a choice that you have. You have to vote one life or the other. Which will it be? A life of surrender to Christ as Lord and Savior, or a life in which you surrender to yourself and your own desires and your own pleasures and your own lust and your own greed and your own jealousies. And then you have to make a choice between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism. You have to make a choice. It's either self or Christ. Which will it be? Not only two ways of life, not only two masters, 
but also you have to choose between two destinies. What is your destiny? Where will you be 50, 100 years from tonight? You'll be somewhere, the real you. Your body will be in the grave perhaps, but you, the real you, your soul, your spirit, the thing that thinks and remembers and loves and so forth, that's the part of you that will live forever, either in heaven or hell, and you've got to make a choice between the two. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, used to emphasize that no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ, and he was right. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with such clarity and authority as did Jesus Christ. One of television's most popular programs during the last year has been entitled Highway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the highway to heaven. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. We went to uh, Romania last year holding meetings, and, and there were thousands of people as far as you could see. And they took me into a place called Moldavia, and they took us on a little sightseeing tour up into the hills and the mountains and so forth, and they took us to churches and buildings that were painted about a thousand years ago with a kind of paint that has never lost its glow and its color, and they don't know how they did it. They think maybe they used honey, but they don't, they're not sure. And all the paintings are religious paintings because the people didn't have any Bibles and they didn't have any uh, Christian literature and they had no way of telling the story of the Bible. So they taught the Bible with paintings on the sides of buildings. And you can see the whole Bible story. And I saw one painting in beautiful blue and the various colors that had lasted a thousand years and I thought to myself, Look at that. It was a picture of a ladder that was going from the fires of hell up to where Jesus was at the top of the ladder in paradise. And down below were demons all the way up that ladder pulling at them, pulling at them, trying to get them into the flames. Then over them were the angels helping them along up that ladder. And I thought that's a little bit like it might be distorted. It may not be theologically exactly right, but they had the idea because there is a constant battle for your soul going on all the time. You see, your soul is important to the devil. He wants your soul. He'll pay any price. And some of you are selling your soul so cheaply. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The devil will give you the whole world if you'll follow him. But some of you will follow him and he won't give you anything. You're just following him because you don't, you're like the pig that's following the man that's dropping the beans, going to the slaughter pen. Every little bit he drops a bean and the pig goes <coughs> following right along. And you don't even think that you're following the devil in the wrong direction. Yes, Jesus Christ is the highway to heaven. But be aware, no man cometh to the Father but by me, he said. And then this choice or this vote that you make has got to be yourself. You must make that vote yourself. For as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't know one, I guess one of the year's most popular songs is Madonna's Papa Don't Preach. Now Joshua didn't hesitate for one moment to preach to those people. He said, as for me and my house, he was voting for Christ, for God. He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. He had to choose for himself. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within us where we retire from all of the fellowship, all of the influences. There's a lonely arena in the depths of your heart where the greatest battle of life must be fought alone. That's your decision about Christ. Your parents can't make it for you. The church can't make it for you. Your friends can't make it for you. Your girlfriend, your boyfriend can't make it for you. You have to make it yourself. You must make the commitment. One of the popular songs according to Billboard is entitled, Lonely Alone. And how true that is. Lonely Alone. 
and it's in that part of you. And when you voted, you yourself had to cast your own vote. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. You choose life, that you and your seed may live. It affects future generations. It affects your children and your grandchildren. A decision that my grandfathers made years ago affects my life today. We read that a generation earlier, Moses had chosen Christ. And the writer to the Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. He could have been commander-in-chief of the armies of Egypt, or he might have been the Pharaoh. All the education, all the wealth of Egypt was his. He turned his back on all of it to suffer with the people of God. He chose God. Who are you choosing? Who are you voting for? choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Oh, yes, there's pleasure in sin for a short time, but it's soon over. The hangover comes, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to be there. Choose Christ, and there'll never be a hangover except joy and peace. That doesn't mean that he'll deliver you from all your troubles and problems and trials because that will go on and on. But they may be different. God allows them. That's a part of our maturing process. That's how God trains us. But down deep inside is a deep river of joy and peace in the midst of the life that you're living. Now, you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. But Christ can change your past. He died on the cross so that all the sins you've ever committed, all the things you've ever done wrong are forgiven. And when God says they're forgiven, he means more than we mean. He means justification. That means just as if you had never committed any sin at all. That's the power of the blood of Christ that we heard him singing about a while ago. I know my sins are under the blood. And the choice involves a price. The apostle Peter wrote, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the pre precious blood of Christ. The price that Jesus paid on the cross when he shed his life blood for you. Martin Luther once said, the founder of, I suppose, the Reformation and the founder of, we could say, almost one of the founders of Protestantism and certainly of the Lutheran churches. He said, when I look at myself, I don't know how I can be saved, but when I look at Jesus, I don't see how I could be lost. John Calvin, who founded Reformed Theology in one sense, and the Presbyterian Church said, upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, I hang my whole eternity. I hang it on Jesus. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, when he lay dying, said, my mind is almost gone. I can remember only two things. I'm a great sinner, but Jesus is a great Savior. Christ is a great Savior. What do you have to do? You have to repent of your sins. That means to be willing to change your way of living. You may have no power to do it. You may not have power to give up some of those habits you know are wrong. You may not have power to fall in love with your wife again. You may not have power to change your whole life that you know needs to be changed. But if you surrender to Christ, he'll give you the power. You say, well, Billy, I don't know what else to do. I've been baptized, I joined the church and so forth, but I don't really have peace and joy and power in my life, all that you're talking about. How do I get it? If you're not sure that you're ready to meet God, if you're not sure you're going to heaven and you're not sure that your sins are forgiven, you come and make sure tonight. I believe that none of you are here by accident tonight. I believe that you're here on this particular night because this is the night that you are to meet God in a new way and receive him into your heart. And it's an urgent decision because to delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision in itself is a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. If you have a ticket for a flight to Atlanta tonight and can't decide whether to go or not, if you wait past the departure time, the choice will have been made. 
The plane will take off without you. Decisions are made whether we make them or not. Time decides if you will not, and time always decides against you. Joel said, put you in the har sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now is the accepted time, the Bible says. Come now while you can. You may not have a chance tomorrow. Today is the day to cast your vote totally for Christ. Sir Walter Scott, the most important of three letters in the English language, he said were N-O-W, now. Bartimaeus was a blind man. Jesus was coming through his town, the little town of Jericho, and he was blind, and he had that one moment, and he cried out, and he said, Jesus, have mercy upon me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And the Scripture says that someone told him that it was Jesus that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He took that one moment. I believe this whole crusade has been planned and prayed for and organized, and we've been brought here maybe just for you. I told people when I came here that I felt we'd come to Tallahassee because of one person. I do not know who that person is, but you may be the person, and it'd be worth all the effort for you. Because you see, Christ would have died on the cross if there'd been nobody but just you. On the rugged, wave-beaten cliffs of the west coast of Scotland, a man was once gathering the eggs of the seabirds which nest there. And he'd been let down from the top of the cliff by a rope to the ledge where the nests were. But in a moment of carelessness, he'd let the rope slip from his hand. He knew that the first swing of the rope would be his only chance, and with all the powers of his body, and mine, he jumped for the rope. He seized it, and he was saved. The rope is swinging in your direction, the rope of salvation from the cross and the empty tomb. God is saying, seize it. The Bible says there'll come a day when they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. There will come a day you'll cry out to God, but it'll be too late. Come now. There may never be a thing like this in your lifetime in Tallahassee, again, ever, when you're so close to the kingdom of God. I'm going to ask you to do something we've seen several hundred people do in the last two days. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I surrender my heart to Jesus Christ. I want to be sure that I'm ready to meet God. And the first day we were here, the wife of a pastor came. People from the choir came. An usher came. And God is speaking to you. You may be the finest Christian in town as far as people think, but deep down inside you know you're not. You need to surrender to Christ and make him Lord and Savior of your life. Why do I ask you to come forward? Because every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. He died on the cross publicly for you. Now you must come publicly and say yes to him. And I'm going to ask everyone to be in an attitude of prayer as you get up and come. Men, women, young people, to cast your vote tonight and vote for Jesus. You know you need him. We're going to wait on you quickly. From up in the top and all around here, God is speaking to you, you come. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now today I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter, the second chapter, beginning with verse five. I hope you've brought your Bibles because we want to talk about a very important subject today, the judgment of God, the love of God, and the coming again of Jesus Christ and the end of the age. Not the end of the world. There's not going to be an end to the world, but there is going to be an end to the age in which we live that's dominated by the devil and dominated by evil. That will come to an end, and Christ the Messiah is going to come back 
We want to talk about that a little bit today. The second chapter of 2 Peter. Now, 2 Peter in your Bibles comes right after 1 Peter, if you're having trouble finding it. Beginning with verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto all those who would live ungodly in the future. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked, for the righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and trials. If you're going through a serious temptation now or trial now, God knows how to deliver you. If you'll turn to him and pray by faith and believe and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. Those that are outside of Christ, those that live wicked lives, are being reserved until the day of judgment. There is a judgment day coming. The biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah comes down to us today as an example of what could happen even in this decade or in the decades ahead if we don't turn to God. Now Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities and they were at the place that now the Dead Sea is in the Middle East. The Dead Sea is 10 miles by 50 mile inland lake in the Lord Jordan Valley. It's a mineral saturated body of water which is 1260 feet below sea level. It's the lowest part of the world. In Genesis 13, we read about Abraham. And Abraham is going through that part of the world with all of his flocks and all of his family, going to the land that God had promised him. He was a man of God. And he had his nephew with him by the name of Lot. And he saw that the servants of Lot and his servants were not getting along too well. So he said to Lot, Lot, let's divide. We've gotten too big. There are too many of us. Too many cattle. Your cattle and my cattle are getting mixed up. You choose wherever you want to live. If you want to go west toward what is now Palestine, or if you want to go across the Jordan, and go to the Jordan Valley, which is lush like a Garden of Eden, you take a choice and I'll take the other way. So Lot looked all around and he looked down toward Sodom. He looked down toward Gomorrah and he saw that that was a very wealthy part of the world, a very wonderful part to live in. He consulted his wife. She said, by all means, we want to go to Sodom. She wanted to go where the good times were. And so Lot told Abraham, all right, Uncle Abraham, we're going to go, we've chosen to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and go down to the lush valley of the Jordan. And we'll take our cattle and our servants and our people and our family and that's where we'll go. Abraham agreed, said, all right. The Dead Sea was surrounded in that time. It was no Dead Sea, of course. But at that time, it was a lush, unbelievably lush part of the world. But with their wealth came a lifestyle of hedonism, sexual obsession, and perversion, the like of which has hardly ever been equaled in the history of the world. So that today, the word Sodom is used to describe a certain lifestyle that people may adopt. As God has sent a flood to destroy a corrupted humanity in Noah's day, so upon Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent a totally destroying judgment of fire. And that fire of brimstone 
that fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah not only destroyed it, but sank that part of the world to the lowest part of the earth. Now, what were the sins of Sodom? Why did God allow that judgment to fall? The first sin that they had was false security. They were secure. And we today have a security behind our oceans and behind our military power. President Yeltsin has stated that the whole world could be standing unknowingly on the edge of an abyss. And you saw in your papers this morning the problems they're having in Russia right now in the government. We have a false security. Woe to them that go down to Egypt. Now, Egypt in that day did not have much to do with Israeli people. And yet, time after time, the Israelis would go down to Egypt for help. And he said, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots. But they look not to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horse is flesh and not spirit. Isaiah the prophet is speaking in the 31st chapter when he says that. They had false security. They thought they were absolutely secure. Nobody could ever take Sodom and Gomorrah. Then their second sin that the scripture mentions is pleasure. They live for pleasure. In Job 20, the fifth chapter, it says, The joy-making of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but a moment. You only have a moment to enjoy it. Then you have eternity to regret it. The scripture says there are pleasures in sin for a moment. Then it's all over. And then there's nothing but the remorse and the guilt. The scripture says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the scripture says, the heart is sorrowful and the end of mirth is heaviness. Even when you're laughing, many people. In Psalm 53, 1, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. But if you go back to the original language in Hebrew, here's what it says. The fool hath said in his heart, no to God. He's not saying there's no God. He's just saying no to God. You see, you can't prove scientifically that there is a God, and you can't prove scientifically there's no God. But everybody knows there must be a God. And then there's another sin that Sodom and Gomorrah committed. It was overindulgence. The majority of the world, a great part of the world, lives under what we call the poverty level. And in Luke 21 it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day comes upon you unaware. John Eastwood wrote some time ago, People do not decide to be drunkards or drunk addicts or prostitutes or murderers of, or thieves, but they pitch their tent towards Sodom and the powers of evil overcome them. And how many of us are like that? We pitch our tent towards Sodom. We sort of live half in Sodom and half with Abraham. We sort of enjoy Sodom. We long for the things that Sodom has. We'd like to have the fun and the pleasure we imagine that they're having. We'd like to have all that money. But the powers of evil will overcome you, and you will die before your time and be lost from God. In Jude, the 12th verse, it says, there are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. How many times we see charitable events and we thank God for those that are sincerely interested, but they go to have a big time and to be seen. And there's a spot in their charity. And that's the spot. And then the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had some new strange gods. Whenever a man seeks 
or honors or exalts anything more than God, that's idolatry. And there are many of us that are guilty of idolatry, but we don't realize it. In Psalm 44, it says, If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hand to a strange God, shall not God search this out? Romans 1, it says, We've changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator. We worship our bodies and we worship our good times and we spend more on our cosmetics than we do worshiping God and Christ. That's modern humanism. And then they were also guilty of greed. Greed was a plague on the lives of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the addictions that today has thousands of Americans in its vice is gambling. And part of the gambling motivation is greed. Workers throughout the industrialized world are becoming increasingly traumatized by overwork and their effort to earn more than their needs require. So we neglect our families to get more money so that we can, and we don't really need it. God has promised to supply all of our needs, but he's never promised to supply all of our greeds. And then in the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, so bad that God gave them up. In Romans 1, it says that God just gave them up three times. He said he gave them up. Has God given you up? No, the very fact you're here today shows that God has not given you up. God is still speaking to you. There's still a chance for you to come to Christ. There's still an opportunity for you to receive the love of God and the gift of God in Christ. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy. And anyone who believes in high morality today is laughed at. Jeremiah said that they had forgotten how to blush. And there's a lot of truth in that. Now, God warned Sodom. He sent some angels to Abraham to tell Abraham what he was going to do. He was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. And Abraham said, wait a minute, Lord. If I would find some real believers in Sodom, if I found 50 righteous men, would you spare it? And God said, yes. He couldn't find 50. So he said to the Lord, all right, Lord, what about if I found 40? Then after a while he said 30, then 20. Finally he said, if I find 10, Lord, would you spare them? And God said, yes, if you find 10 righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare Sodom. But he couldn't find them. And that is a lesson to us, the importance of a dedicated minority a minority of people who believe and who live it. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah, says Isaiah 1, 9. To you Christians, Jesus gave a warning. He said, remember Lot's wife? The angels told you not to look back if you did look back, you'd be turned to a pillar of salt. Well, she did look back. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. That's an example for us today. Remember Lot's wife, one of the shortest verses in all the Bible. Don't look back. Many of us look longingly at the world, and many are like Demas, having forsaken Christ because of the love of this present world. Now, the climax of history is going to be judgment. The Bible warns that the world is in for a gigantic judgment. 
The only bright spot is the promised return of Jesus Christ because the scripture teaches from one end to the other that Christ is going to come back someday. He's going to set up his kingdom and evil and the devil are going to be eliminated and this is going to be heaven on earth when Jesus comes back. You see, Jesus Christ loved us so much that he went to the cross and died for us. He took all the hell and all the judgment on him at the cross. And the scripture says, God so loved the world, God so loved this present world, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that includes you, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You say, well, when is Christ going to come back? Jesus said, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We don't know the day. Don't, don't speculate. It's coming. It's sure. He left us certain signs. I wish we had time to go into all of them today. I believe that every one of those signs is being fulfilled right now. And Christ could come back at any time. For, how will Christ come? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a glorious time that's going to be when Christ returns. The voice of the archangel. I'm looking forward to hearing that voice. I've never heard an archangel. And the trump of God. What trump that'll, trumpets that'll be. Now it'll also be a time of personal judgment when you, if you've really never received Christ, now you may be baptized and you may be confirmed and you may be a church member and all of that. That's wonderful. I'm thankful. But that's not enough. Jesus talked to Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, all your religion is not enough. You must be born again. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you open your heart and surrender to him as Lord and Master and Savior, at that moment, your name is written in the book of life. And if my name were not written in that book of life, you'd never get me out of this stadium until I'd made sure it's been written there. Because only those who are written in the book of life are going to enter the kingdom of God. You see, for those who are written in the book of life, Jesus Christ died on the cross. They put nails in his hands and a spike through his side and a crown of thorns on his brow. And he suffered one of the most agonizing physical deaths that a person can suffer. But that wasn't his real suffering. The real suffering of Jesus Christ was when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment, God took your sins and my sin and laid on Christ. He bore our sins. He went to hell for us. He took the judgment for us. So the cross is a judgment. What do you have to do? Repent of your sins and you're not sure that you've repented, to surrender totally to Christ, your heart, your mind, your body, your life, so that Christ is first in your life. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment this afternoon. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen thousands of people do this past week. Get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. And you can get up and go back and join your friends. We're going to give you some literature, a book that will help you in your Christian life. But you get up and come. And don't delay, because he says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You may never have another moment like this as long as you live. When will you ever see another thing like this in Pittsburgh? Maybe another generation, or maybe never. And as far as you're concerned, it may never be. We're going to wait for you. You come from way up there, wherever you are. 
God is speaking to you. And back here, where the seats have filled in, you come and join them.